All right, I am joined now by my friend from West Lynn, Oregon, Chael Sonnen. Chael, how are you, man? Never better, buddy. How's everything? Everything is good. Listen, your life is good, man. You, you live where you want to live. You do what you want to do. You've got tons of fun businesses. Why do you want to fight in a cage again? Is it love of the art form? Is it the excitement? Is it the cash? Well, why are you doing that? Uh, you know what? It, this is the only game I know how to play, man. I never, I never got into tennis or golf or any of that stuff. I, I, I was a wrestler growing up, and uh, I still got some miles left, man. And as much as I see these guys try to copy me, I appreciate that they read the book, but I can tell there's still a couple of chapters I need to write. You know, you know I work for the UFC, and here at Fight Network, we are UFC broadcast partners. Do you think I'm going to get in trouble for talking to you here? Like, I didn't check with Dana. Are you cool with him? Are you cool with the UFC? Man, D Dana's one of my favorite guys ever. I love the UFC. I I've got no resentment anywhere, but um, I'm looking to compete, man. I'm and I I'm going to go compete over in Bellator. So uh, Tito's the first guy you're talking about. Why, why Tito? Is there, is it his name value? Is it the size of his head? Is there anything in particular about Tito Ortiz? Yeah, I think it's his name value uh, in front of everything else. You know, I'm on a legend's ass whipping tour right now. I've been on it for a little while, but I just got out of the principal's office and I'm going to pick up right where I left off. You know, this is different than other sports. That's why I asked you about Dana. It's not like in the NBA or the NFL, you know, they trade a star, they get another star player back. You're just gone and now you're on the other team. You know, you've got to figure that the UFC doesn't love that. You know, I, I suppose you make a fair point, and that is just the way this industry goes. Yeah, the boxing model wasn't that way. You could get the other organizations together, but uh, they've been around for a lot longer, too. Right now in MMA, the way it works, you've got to pick an organization. You fight the guys within that organization. Um, that's just the deal, man. I didn't create those rules, but I'm, I, I'm living and competing in part of it. So I think you're right. Uh, let's shift gears here for a second. You know, I love to analyze fights. And that's something you are very good at, too. Michael Bisping's going to fight Dan Henderson. He's a good friend of yours. You've trained with him forever. How do you see this fight going down? Yeah, so I think that Michael Bisping right now has the edge on him in a lot of areas. I think he's a little quicker than him. Uh, there's something to be said for momentum. Uh, Bisping's got one big problem that cannot be ignored. And, and, and as an athlete, I can tell you it's real. And that is when, when you have an experience with a guy and, and it's that one-sided, and it becomes a highlight reel, and it's something you think about every day, and then all of a sudden you start dwelling on it, uh, and you're faced with that guy again, it doesn't really come down to skill versus skill or, or, or tit for tat at all. It, there's a big psychological disadvantage that, that Bisping's at. How, how's he going to deal with that? Well, he's the champion of the world. Uh, I think that if anyone can be mentally tough enough to deal with some of the struggles, it's going to be Mike, but... Uh, I don't think you can just look at these guys athletically and say, well, Mike's at the top of the mountain and, and, and Dan had climbed it a few times and, and is getting ready to retire. While those things might be true, uh, there are some psychological intangibles that, that only Michael Bisping knows about. You know, I, we've heard from people before that when there's one big weapon, and you make a great point about uh, Bisping being killed by that weapon in their last fight. But when there's one big weapon, a uh, fighter will study that weapon and they almost overstudy it to the point that they themselves walk themselves into it. Have you ever had that experience in a fight? I haven't had it in a fight. I've had it in wrestling competitions where a guy's got a technique, you know he's got it, you, you swear up and down you're gonna stop it and defend it and, and for some reason you align the world against you and you just fall right into that very position. So. Uh, you know, guys said that about Mike Tyson, though, for years, too, that he's, he's got the uppercut to a hook, and, and, and every single one of them got uppercutted and hooked. So I think that it is a misconception by analysts at times to try to break down what somebody does and then use that as a way of saying, therefore, it's not going to happen, man. Babe Ruth would come out, he'd tell you exactly where he was going to put the ball, and he'd do it anyway. You know, there's something about you. I don't know what it is. We, you know, we, uh, as fans, as, as people who love fighting, there's something so likable about Chael Sonnen. Maybe not everybody agrees, but I think a lot of people do. And there's a Teflon element to you where it doesn't matter kind of what goes wrong, you're able to kind of bounce back even higher. Could you teach that to John Jones? Yeah, boy, I tell you what, old, old John's not done either, man. Old, old John's not done. He's, at some point, John is going to have to come out and go, Here's what my problems are. 
And until he does that, and he doesn't have to do it for us, he can do it privately in his bedroom, but until he does that, he's not going to make any progress. And, and that's not me trying to preach to him. That's, that's just the laws, again, of psychology. If you want to talk to anybody uh, that's got a problem, the first thing they have to do is admit they have a problem. Uh, John's not there yet, man. He's in the denial phase, and that means he's not ready to, to get better. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, somebody you have a problem with is Vanderlei. Uh, you got to be hearing rumors that he's either with Bellator or going to be with Bellator. What's the story there? Yeah, what, what you just said, I am hearing those rumors. I'm hearing the rumors that uh, they're going to acquire him quickly or Ryzen is going to acquire him, and then they've got some kind of a relationship. I don't even know what that relationship is other than as a fan. I watched King Mo, who signed with Bellator, go over and uh, clean house in Ryzen. So... I have to assume that they've got Vandalay one way or the other, or to your point, they're about to very quickly. And I do believe that Vandalay is in my very near future. Jill, can you make us a little bit of money here on our YouTube hits? Uh, you've already recorded uh, The Apprentice. Did you win? Well, see, here's the thing. They don't want us to say who won, but then they come out and they said everybody who's competing. And it's like, guys, I'll do my best to keep the secret as well, but you don't have to put on your Columbo rain jacket to see that Chael's going to clean, clean up this field. I mean, you got a room full of dummies versus one genius. They're the ones that – that's on NBC, man. I didn't, I'm not the one that put out the release. <laughs> Chael, we're going to let you go. I really appreciate your time, man. I saw on Bellator the other day that you said you have two friends. They're both outside of Bellator. Who's the other one? I mean, one's right here. Who's the other guy? That's right. You are one of them, and the other shall, re, uh, shall remain nameless. Chael's my friend. Thank you so much for joining oh, me. Wait, wait, wait. Robin, before you go, I have one final thing to tell you. What's that? Kaboom. Chael, son, and ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks, Chael.